um, and welcome to August's webinar Wednesday hosted by the Society for Conservation Biology. I'm Sarah Weber. I'm the Communications and Marketing Manager here at the Executive Office, and I am so excited to announce um, or introduce our speaker um, this afternoon. Brooke Tully is the president of SCB's Conservation, Marketing, and Engagement Working Group and has been a member of the board since 2017. Um, some of you may have even met her during workshops last year at the Conservation Marketing Congress and in collaboration with the Social Science Working Group at the NACCB in Toronto. In her independent work, Brooke offers online courses, workshops, and consulting services that provide practical steps for creating communication and outreach plans that motivate people to take conservation-related actions. And the word on the street is that she has a pretty great email newsletter as well. So um, Brooke is here with me today. Um, we will be sharing a slide presentation um, throughout this webinar. Um, and the webinar is also going to be recorded. So we'll be able to send this link out to you afterwards in case you miss anything. Um, a quick few ground rules before we begin. Um, you are all currently muted, um, but we will really encourage you to ask questions because um, after Brooke's presentation, there will be about 15, 10 minutes um, for question and answer at the end of the presentation. In order to ask questions, please go to your chat box um, and you will be able to ask questions there. I'll be taking them down and then I will ask Brooke those questions following her presentation. Um, so sit back, relax and enjoy the presentation. I will be getting it right now. Thank you so much, Sarah. And hi everyone, uh, welcome. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, it is great to be here and I really appreciate uh, SCB, the Society for Conservation Biology, uh, for creating opportunities to do something like this. So it's really exciting. Uh, today I'm going to be sharing more about the topic of our working group, conservation marketing and engagement. Uh, we'll be talking about using marketing and engagement strategies to achieve conservation goals. Uh, and what we'll cover, and what I hope to cover over the next 35, 45 minutes, depending how long I talk, um, is defining what conservation marketing is and the role it plays. Uh, looking at some examples of conservation marketing in action. Uh, these are programs that are happening now. Um, and towards the tail end, share a bit about the working group, what we have going on, uh, and opportunities to learn more and get involved. Um, before I move forward, I do, I see in the chat box, people are already saying where they're tuning in from, which is really exciting. And I do encourage everyone to just jump in chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. I see Peru, Kenya, I mean, we are international here. Uh, China, uh, some of you are on time zones right now that I know uh, is late or early in the morning. So I super appreciate you being here. Uh, South Africa, Nepal, Bolivia, truly uh, an inter international presence, so this is exciting. Um, I'm tuning in from a place called the Mid-Hudson Valley in New York, uh, a city called Poughkeepsie, and it's currently pouring rain outside right now, even though it was sunny this morning. Um, so thank you all for everyone who's joining us. I'm gonna share a little bit about myself. Uh, it'll complement the bio that Sarah gave. Um, so you know kind of what my street cred is here and why you're even listening to me in the first place. Um, that's a picture of me. This is also a picture of me. That's my favorite professional work shirt in that picture, uh, so you'll see it a lot. Um, I specialize in designing behavior change communi communication strategies for conservation. Uh, in many ways, you can call this conservation marketing and engagement. It's what I do. Uh, it's very much a culmination of my career. I started uh, in the commercial sector working at ad agencies doing traditional marketing. Um, I switched my career to get into wildlife conservation and worked at RARE for nine years, which is a behavior change for conservation organization. Uh, and then for the past three years, I've been doing this uh, independently as both a trainer and a consultant. Uh, you can check out a bit more about what I do at my website at uh, brooktully.com. Uh, and I've been on the Conservation Marketing Board uh, since 2017, initially as the treasurer, and this year I've been serving as a president. So really excited to be able to represent this working group today and share more about what we're doing. So what exactly is conservation marketing? This is probably why you showed up today. Uh, well, the working group defines it as the process of applying marketing and audience engagement strategies, concepts, and techniques 
to shape behaviors to help achieve conservation goals. And that's probably the, the big important part of that sentence is that we're shaping behaviors to help achieve conservation goals. There's a lot of different methods and theories that can be used to achieve this goal. Um, conservation marketing honestly pulls from a lot of different disciplines, from social marketing, uh, social and behavior change communications. And some of these may be uh, more popular terms you're more familiar with to describe a very similar process and method. Um, behavioral economics, science communications, environmental education and interpretation, even the commercial marketing world, and conservation psychology. And I certainly want to give a shout out to our social science working group peeps. Uh, we do have some overlaps in our working groups and our topic areas. Uh, and social science research just plays a hugely critical and fundamental role in a lot of the strategies and concepts and methods we apply in conservation marketing. Uh, so thank you, uh, social science folks, for the work that you do uh, and for giving us the insight uh, and the tools and ideas for how to understand people, understand social groups, understand dynamics, and how can we use that to uh, move levers towards shaping behaviors. Uh, and related to that, how does conservation marketing actually help achieve our conservation goals? Uh, and that's really the bottom line focus for us is these are tools and techniques that are meant to help us achieve our big picture conservation goals. Uh, and these can be things, these are some of the big ones and it's certainly a, not an exhaustive list on the right side. Increasing population sizes of our flora and fauna, preserving and replenishing habitats and ecosystems, uh, stabilizing and ideally even in increasing the health of our natural resources. And when we look at what, is, what do we need, what does it take to achieve those conservation goals, we often find ourselves looking at human behavior and then developing a set of behavior change goals. Everything from reducing and even eliminating uh, unsustainable behaviors such as harvesting, hunting, fishing, livestock management. Um, our, our three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, these are all behaviors that uh, we're often asking people to do. Um, increasing the sustainable use of natural resources and shifting away from unsustainable use of those same resources. And even things like reporting, uh, compliance, uh, enforcement, even self-enforcement, and enacting policy change. Um, so these you know, our conservation goals quickly start to become behavior change goals. And conservation marketing can help shape those behaviors in a variety of different ways. Uh, some examples here can be used to decrease and remove barriers to change, especially psychological barriers to change that often exist that make it really hard for people to uh, have the intention or the, the desire to do something different or new. Um, Related to that, we can use it to increase motivations, uh, increase the intention, increase that drive, uh, use tools around creating buzz and social pressure, which can be uh, hugely powerful in shifting behaviors. The fact that change is happening, get on board. This is, this is something that's happening around you. Uh, we can explore tools like choice architecture, nudges and prompts, many of that coming from the behavioral economics field. Um, and even from the start, when we're designing our projects, we can use a lot of these engagement and marketing methods to secure stakeholder participation, involvement, and get stronger buy-in from the get-go um, to, you know, hopefully, fingers crossed, avoid any resistance down the road. Now, while we do pull methods from a variety of different areas, which means that, you know, for every project, your conservation marketing method might look a little bit different than the one previous and the one from another organization, there are some, like, core fundamentals about how it helps to achieve behavior change goals. Um, and it really comes down to, like, deeply understanding our audiences, being able to identify them and define who these segments are, um, but also why they are doing these current behaviors and increasingly importantly, identifying those motivators. So what are those strategies that are most likely to motivate people to do something new or do something differently? Uh, and that comes in a lot of different research methods, uh, certainly quantitative, but complementing it with various forms of qualitative research and even observational research. 
to understand what are those internal and intrinsic motivators that we can tap into to uh, move people towards different behaviors. Uh, another core component of conservation marketing is communication methods. So where is our audience? What are the opportunities to engage with them and to reach them, either on a mass media scale or on an interpersonal scale? Um, how, when, and where? Uh, and, and being able to answer those questions for these programs. And then ultimately, empower the change. Uh, make it socially acceptable to do. Change is super hard. It can be really scary. So how do we make it socially acceptable and even how do we make it cool to do? Uh, and yes, these behaviors can become cool to do. That's the exciting part. But I do want to touch on what conservation marketing is not. Uh, so it's not manipulation. It's not sleazy. It's not false advertising or fake news. It's not sales. But I do recognize and I do know uh, and I do hear that many folks in the conservation world and the science world the word marketing can be a turnoff for them. You know, and, and I get it, you know, uh, marketing on, on a traditional scale, even uh, the way I started my career, they haven't necessarily earned the most stellar reputation. Uh, there was always a joke when I worked in advertising that when they would do uh, ranks of the most trusted professions, advertising was one up from the bottom from car salesmen. Uh, so yes, we don't have the, the best reputation and I think often in our field, we look at them mainly as uh, plugging things like cigarettes and sugary drinks and overconsumption. But if we are able to look beyond how it's used for less desirable means and less constructive means, we can actually see that these techniques, these methods and these this tool is actually extremely powerful and can be equally used to promote really productive, constructive, sustainable, and regenerative uh, behaviors that we're seeking to do. Uh, so it is powerful, and any powerful tool can be used for evil and for good, so we can use it for good. Um, and frankly, this is something that conservation needs to do a lot more of. Um, and some of the reasons why it is so needed in the work that we do is because we are dealing with human behavior most often. and Humans themselves are complex. The method to achieve change is rarely ever linear. Um, it's not a no think do process. Uh, it's much more complicated than that. And the tools in conservation marketing and engagement allow us to understand more intimately what it is that's driving certain behaviors or that's preventing certain behaviors and how we can use those to drive more constructive, productive, sustainable behaviors. And frankly, the traditional approaches we've been using aren't producing the desired results at the rate that we want. Um, we've been using things like, you know, start leading with facts, focus only on awareness, um, even doom and gloom and shock at times. And those are just not producing the results that we need. So we really, uh, you know, our working group is really a call for pulling in other tools that can complement our existing efforts so we can see the desired results. And lastly, there is an increased competition for time, attention, and money. Um, you know, it's great that globally and nationally we're all becoming a bit more woke, uh, and we need to be. But that also means there's a lot of different passion areas and passion points surfacing, and that frankly, is competition from the environment and uh, from conservation. People are getting a lot of messages to support and help and volunteer and act in a variety of different ways. Conservation can lose a top of mind status. Uh, we can use tools like this to engage people, to keep conservation co top of mind, and to move more and more people towards action. And that's really the goal here. And, you know, we're not alone in this. Uh, you know, obviously many fields have been using techniques like this to shape behaviors for different results. Everything from improving personal health, education and equity, uh, promoting and encouraging safe driving and traffic law compliance. Um, and, and that's a point, too, that even when you have laws in place, we still need to be driving behaviors around those laws um, and supporting, uh, you know, kindness and inclusion and even, you know, bully prevention among school kids. We have also been using these techniques and tools in conservation. 
good old Smokey the Bear, you know, only you can prevent forest fires or wildfires. I wonder if that's changed from wild to forest fires. Uh, is celebrating their 75th campaign anniversary this year. Uh, I imagine 75 is uh, older than most of us who are on this call today. Uh, so that's a really long running campaign that is one of the first you know, social marketing, conservation marketing campaigns that's ever been out there. So I'm going to pause before I get into examples of uh, other conservation marketing and engagement uh, campaigns that we have going on right now to hear from you in the chat box. What does this remind you of? What are some other campaigns that you have seen, that you recall, that you might be experiencing right now that are aiming to shape your behavior? Uh, and this could be any behavior. It doesn't have to be conservation related. Uh, but I'd love to hear what does this come up for you? Is it a traffic, uh, you know, driving campaign you've seen, uh, anti-littering? Um, so if you jump in the chat box, I'd love to see what you're coming up with. I don't see anybody jumping in yet. I might need to jog your jog memories on conservation marketing or social marketing campaigns. Let me give you a few minutes there. Is anyone on a smoker? You've experienced campaigns that tell you to stop smoking. Uh, any that talk about uh, eating X number of servings of vegetables a day? Well, keep Perfect. thinking. Perfect. Chime I can in. see them if you can't see them. Oh, OK. They're Let's not coming in up. on my end. Okay. Got it. I thought it, the newest ones were on the bottom. The oh, newest no. ones are on the top. <laughs> there you go. Great. All right. Awesome. Single use plastic. Yes. The ditching the straw thing is huge. Um, drunk driving, buzz driving is another one that's out there a lot. Seatbelt use. And think about that. Seatbelt use. We're still we're still using campaigns to get people to buckle their seatbelt after so many years. So uh, these are important things uh, that do take a long time and, and the, the marketing and engagement aspects are very important tools in the toolbox. <laughs> Great, thank you. I love, I love the contributions and I'm sorry I missed them at first. I was all the way at the bottom where everybody was saying hi where they're from. So I am going to move into sharing some examples because uh, I think this is a bit more interesting than just hearing me talk about what conservation marketing is. Uh, I'd rather show some examples of what conservation marketing can include. Um, these are examples, and uh, I'm going to call them like mini case studies because I only have about three slides on each, from some of our uh, conference presenters that we had last year, 2018, for our conservation marketing and engagement conference, the first conference we've ever done. Um, I really appreciate these presenters trusting me with their content. Um, and I am doing my best to uh, present their work as thoroughly as I can, uh, knowing that I'm not actually actively involved in their work. So um, this is going to be a, a high level view on what our different peers are doing with conservation marketing. Uh, the first one is a campaign by Zoos Victoria, uh, and this is a community behavior change campaign that they're running. Uh, the topic of this is blowing bubbles to save seabirds. Balloons, you, you may know this or not, uh, balloons are one of the top three most harmful pollutants threatening marine wildlife. Uh, they continue to get released or they escape from outdoor events, celebrations. You know, it's uh, in many places, including Australia here in the U.S., it's, you know, it's tradition to kind of bring out a bunch of balloons for a celebration. This campaign introduces an alternative behavior. So to blow bubbles instead of using balloons. And I just want to call that out is that's a very important benefit um, that that helps a conservation marketing program is instead of saying, and this is some of our traditional approaches, stop doing this, don't do that, we can redirect a behavior towards an alternative. Uh, we're not saying people can't celebrate anymore. We're asking them to celebrate in a different way that's a more sustainable way. Uh, so I really appreciate the fact that they're using an alternative behavior here. 
Uh, a variety of techniques they use are public commitments, uh, both online and social media, but also in their zoos and, and those zoo spaces directly. Public commitments can go a long way in in uh, increasing the accountability and the responsibility. Once you put your name down and said you're willing to do something or even willing to try to do something, uh, there is uh, a psychological process that makes you feel a bit more accountable to doing so. Um, and one of the last examples I'll share talks a bit more about the data around commitments and pledges. So that, that'll be fascinating to end with that. Um, it also taps into social proof. You can see that over 140,000 people have already shown their support. This helps to feel that this is something that's happening. Other people are doing it. And therefore, honestly, it's a bit more safe for me to join this as well. Um, and you feel a bit of the, the social peer pressure to do it. Uh, they created a badge, Balloon Smart Seabird Safe, that were for um, businesses and organizations in the area to display that they were committed to not using balloons for their, their public outdoor events. Um, and that's great for, you know, both as an organization or a business to proudly display that, but then also for a consumer to know that this is a business committed to protecting, you know, seabirds and other marine wildlife in the area. Uh, Zoos Victoria also ran, and I think this won a Guinness World Record, uh, in a stadium, the most number of people blowing bubbles at the same time. Um, certainly that makes it fun and engaging and uh, a social activity. It also demonstrates the behavior, uh, and that's really powerful to show we can have fun, we can celebrate using bubbles, we don't need balloons. Um, so some really great examples of, of strategies and tactics here. Some of the results to date, uh, a lot of this has been around shifting what is considered appropriate uh, norms for celebration, especially outdoor celebrations. Um, they've gotten a ton of publicity, uh, even action. So groups that are started to volunteer to pick up balloon litter on the beaches. Uh, they had over 250 of those you know, businesses that became uh, balloon smart supporters. And again, over 140,000 people pledging to not use balloons at their next event and to use bubbles instead. That's awesome. All of that is shows a shift where people may not have even thought about it before. Uh, balloons were just the status quo. You're now seeing a shift towards people saying, let's use bubbles instead. I encourage you to go to their website that's listed here. They have a ton of community behavior change campaigns running uh, with information on all of them. And I think there are just a lot of great examples here of how both marketing and engagement strategies can be used towards achieving goals. This next example is a little bit different, uh, and it's really looking at games and gamification that helps to engage, educate, and create connections with conservation initiatives. Uh, this was uh, called Survive the Sound, and it was presented by Long Live the Kings. It's a free, interactive online game. You can follow your favorite fish character as it migrates through these channels. Uh, and it's not just a game. It's actually a game that's based on and uses real-life data from the tracking devices that they have uh, with all the accurate pieces of obstacles that may be in the water um, and also accurate mortality rates. So that will affect your chances of winning this game. Um, and the intention here is to develop a deeper connection to the environment, to the species, and then encourage players to take action after they've had this really fun, engaging experience. So a brief example of how this looks, and pretty sure you can go online to their site to play it. And I have the, the website on the next page. Uh, you, you pick your fish. I pick Sammy for this example. He's the pirate fish. Uh, you know, the game starts, and you can start to pick if, you know, there's a fork in the channel, which one am I going to go, left or right? Uh, you see some of these obstacles like a low-lying bridge or um, a falls or a dam. And it shows you, you know, that path that Sammy's taking based on that real-life data. So maybe he's got to go backwards. Maybe keeps trying a bunch of times. Uh, unfortunately, when I played this one, uh, you know, Sammy didn't make it for this one. And I guess that that's an accurate portrayal of, of the mortality rates. Um, but you learn a whole lot more and you kind of create an affinity for this, this species and their process, uh, their migration routes that, again, you may not have known before and may not be as interesting to learn through, you know, sort of a dry presentation. You're really part of the process here. You become Sammy, essentially. 
Um, some data they have, and this is just from this year, uh, over 7,000 game participants, adults and children. Uh, so game and gamification is not just for kids. Uh, there's some great apps out there that are using things like leaderboards and other gamification aspects that uh, even contribute to citizen science. So you know, get people to put in their data, their phishing data or otherwise, um, because we love we love that aspect of, of play and it's really important. Um, so even uh, some of the, the participants they had playing this year were educators and there's an opportunity for that ripple effect for them to there share it with even more children. People felt much more likely or claimed to be much more likely to take action after playing this game. And some of those actions range from talking to others, volunteering or donating, contacting their elect elected official, and even changing some of their daily routines. Um, so this level of engagement creates a certain affinity which can help drive action. Um, I think my picture here is covering part of the website, um, but there's more at survivethesound.org and lltk.org, the stand for long live the kings.org. Um, so maybe you can play and, and do a better job of uh, navigating Sammy so he, he, you know, do better than I did. <laughs> um, I see someone here, you killed Sammy, I know, I'm terrible at this. Um, so another example here is marketing responsible tourism activities. Reaching tourists is sort of a, a notoriously hard challenge for conservationists. Uh, they're, they're transient. Uh, they're, they can be hard to reach, you're not always sure where they're going, um, and frankly, they just may not care as much about the local environment as the people who live there. Uh, so it's a, it's a tough audience to reach. Um, and this program was one that was uh, all focused on tourism activities and tourists themselves. It was called Whale Sense, still active now, uh, put together by NOAA Fisheries, Whale and Dolphin Conservation, and National Marine Sanctuaries. Uh, and the focus of the project, some of the challenges that led to this is whale, wo whale watch boat operators weren't really complying with the, the speed and distances when whales were present. Um, and there wasn't that level of like self-compliance uh, happening. Along with that, there were some struggles with, you know, NOAA in particular having relationships with the, those whale watch operators because they represented a government agency. And uh, everyone's facing some pressure from tourists to have the best whale watch show for their money. Um, and that can kind of drive uh, the pressure to get as close to the whales as possible, even though that was against regulations. Their goal with this, this effort in this campaign was to build greater trust within the industry, raise the standards for whale watch operators for what good looks like, especially with compliance, and then make responsible viewing desirable for tourists. I mean, that's uh, no, no small feat here uh, for what this campaign is aiming to achieve. There are three aspects of this program that I really want to call out here is one is their level of audience research. They did a bunch of in-depth uh, research to really understand who these segments were, uh, boat operators, captains, naturalists, tourists, uh, and understand some of their main concerns, which helped them uncover some new things that they might not have been able to see on the surface, um, such as uh, boat operators and naturalists feeling a sense of apprehension about telling the tourists on what the whale watch regulations were. Uh, they felt like they talked about these guidelines and how they weren't supposed to get close to the whales, that it would sort of ruin the, the vibe and the experience of the whale watch. Um, they also did a ton around stakeholder involvement, so engaging those audience segments at the beginning of the program, make sure that it was all captured accurately, they really understood their concerns, but also to make sure that what they were creating is something that they'd be willing to adopt and have buy-in and, and involvement with. So that's uh, you know equally very awesome. Um, and things like that, that level of stakeholder involvement can prevent down the road it feeling like a top-down effort or an us versus them effort. And those are things we you know, would really want to avoid in our conservation programs. And ultimately, they decided to create an independent brand, this whale sense brand. Um, so the three partners that were involved you know, foregoed their own branding for this. And having a unique independent brand helped create that shared ownership with the stakeholders that were, they were involving 
and can even remove some baggage if there is baggage between, let's say, in this case, a, a government agency being represented. Um, and those aspects, so things around branding, uh, you know, finding a name, finding a logo, a tone of voice, all are, also can fall under the conservation marketing field as well. Uh, some of the results to date, th this program's been running for 10 years, continues to run, continues to grow. Uh, there's more information at their website at whalesense.org. Um, and they've seen the number of fleets continue to grow, mainly from word of mouth and that social, pref social proof and competition between the groups. Uh, and that's really powerful. It shows that uh, at some point there's a tipping point where it's not us as the implementing agency encouraging our partners to get involved, it's then partners are telling one another to get involved. Uh, and same with our consumer audiences as well. And that word of mouth is really powerful. Uh, they've been seeing growing engagement from uh, tourists as well on social media, uh, including going to the website and finding out which whale watch operators are, are under this whale sense badge uh, and can I book tickets directly with them. Uh, and they even had some unexpected and wonderful uh, outcomes of this was they actually received an increase in entanglement reports from these whale watch operators, which wasn't really happening uh, so much, you know, at the early stages and increased cooperation um, across the companies. So both the um, implementing agencies and the, and the operators, but also across whale watch operators. So they would normally see each other's competition and they started collaborating a lot more as well. So um, unexpected, really great benefits came out or continue to come out of this program. Shifting consumption patterns, especially when we talk about bushmeat consumption, again, a long-standing issue we've been tackling um, and a very, very complex issue. Uh, and this is a, a project by Wildlife Conservation Society. The long-term goal, you know, this goes back to the conservation goals, is to decrease the threats to wildlife population. Uh, and the behavior change goal here is really to reduce the consumption of bushmeat. As many uh, conservation marketing efforts are, it's part of a much bigger effort that includes everything from enforcement, regulations, livelihoods, wildlife management, and protected areas. Uh, so this is an important tool to have in the toolbox uh, and it really complements a lot of efforts very well. Similar to whale sense, there are some parts here that I want to call out uh, that both really represent the methodology of conservation marketing, but also really represents, you know, what a great job uh, WCS is doing with this work. Um, again, in-depth audience research. Who's actually eating bushmeat and how often are they eating it? What are the realities of this behavior especially compared to some of our perceptions of what's happening. Um, and even understanding their drivers. So why would they choose bushmeat over other options? Even other proteins that those same audience members would consider to be more important proteins for them. Uh, understanding the cultural and consumer context around the behavior and around what ultimately will be the campaign space. Um, the understanding the Congolese identity and how, how it's shifting, right? A lot of our uh, cultures and identities tend to shift over, over time. So what's happening today? Um, and what would it mean to shift perceptions around what is most common and normal to eat uh, or not eat? And how are current perceptions different than current realities? So even related to the research above. Um, as well as looking at, and I, I really love this aspect of this campaign as well, is looking at things like a brand promise and a brand tone. Uh, a lot of that is represented on the right side of the screen. Uh, part of the tone that they decide is they want to be welcoming, celebratory, and modern. So this is describing how the campaign's going to look and feel. Uh, and that's such an important aspect of how we create something that resonates with our audience. Um, their brand promise, a Congolese campaign for Congolese, with Congolese, and to preserve Congolese resources. So really tapping into that, that uh, sense of a, a Congolese identity, uh, which is just you know, fascinating. And the next slide here is some examples of the actual work. Um, so uh, they have a full media and outreach plan, everything from high visibility, TV, billboards, uh, to more direct approaches, uh, brochures and fact sheets, and even aprons, which you see in one of the ad executions on the right. They came up with their own logo, 
uh, slogan, eat less bush meat in the city. And something I do want to call out here is that, again, it's not a don't eat bush meat or stop eating bush meat. It's eat less bush meat, which makes it a much more um, realistic and doable behavior for people uh, and makes it even a more acceptable behavior because they're not feeling like it's something that they can't do or don't do. In the United States and other countries, we're seeing this a lot with, with beef. Uh, eat less meat you know, in your weekly diet. So this is a very similar approach with, with bush meat. Uh, some examples here, and they, they have more. I just picked two out. Uh, the headlines, it's normal not to eat bush meat in the city, and it's possible to prepare Congolese dishes without bush meat. And again, these are talking about descriptive norms and what happens out there and makes it socially acceptable and um, even plants the seed of, I can choose a dish that doesn't have bush meat in it. Other people are doing it as well. Uh, so really great work. I'll add that uh, when this group presented last year, uh, these campaign uh, material pieces weren't yet developed. Uh, so this is in process now. Uh, it's out there, so there's not yet results on the table, um, but it's been awesome to really see this moving along. And then certainly conservation marketing and engagement is not without its data and science. So uh, if that's a perception you have, uh, we're here to prove it wrong, that there is data and science behind this as well. Uh, this is an example, <coughs> excuse me, from the San Diego Zoo's Institute, Institute for Conservation Research. And here they were evaluating the effectiveness of pledges. It kind of relates back to one of the first examples I showed, uh, especially among school children. So the question they were asking is, you know, are people actually taking action after they take a pledge? Does the amount of behavior change depend on which action they pledge to do? And or does it depend on how that pledge is taken? They uh, tested a variety of different ways. I'm going to show some of the outcomes of this. Again, I was not intimately involved in the, the data collection or analysis, so I may not be able to answer all your questions on this. Uh, but I pulled out some that I thought were fairly interesting that I wanted to share here. Um, one was measuring the pledge action variable. So does the, the rate of change depend on which pledge, uh, which action people pledge to do? On the left side of the screen, it's interesting to note that uh, the actions most pledge were saying no to straws, uh, picking up litter when you see them, and turning off lights when you're not in a room or when you leave a room. Uh, those had the highest rate of pledges. Um, lower rate of pledges were turning off the shower when you're sudsing up. You know, I admit for myself that's a hard one to do, to commit to. Uh, and the app was a um, palm oil shopping app, so one that you can use when you're shopping to see if uh, a product has palm oil or not. So although there were different rates of pledges for different actions, but what's interesting to know is the rate of action didn't necessarily change quite as much as you would think um, between the different pledges. Uh, and the chart on the right shows the degree of change. Stars are statistically significant changes. The more stars, the more statistically significant. Uh, so you see that taking a shower and app, while they had lower numbers of pledges, did have big shifts in action, uh, which is pretty great and everything was above 50% of action. So um, it's interesting to see how rate of action is not necessarily dependent on which one you pledge for. Another thing they looked at is how these pledges were taken. Uh, the three options, one was a class vote. So they were presented three options, class voted on which one they were going to do. Another one was verbal, so presented three options and then suggested verbally which one students should pledge. Uh, and the last one, the PRES one, that was a prescribed action. So uh, at the end of the presentation that everyone uh, was there for, they prescribed a particular action that uh, the students were asked to pledge to do. Uh, they will note that the prescribed action was one of the more complicated actions, uh, whereas you know ver verbal and vote, they you know kind of got to pick uh, easier ones. Uh, so what this chart is showing us is that more students pledged when it was a class vote, likely due to the peer pressure around that, uh, but the rate of change was almost equal across the three. Um, so I wanted to share this to show that we are continuing to look at these different methods and mechanisms to see what's working, what could use improvement, why is it working, 
and are there variances in what we're asking people to do and how we're asking them. Uh, one interesting side note that I don't have an image of here is that students that went through the presentation and the voting process but didn't explicitly write down a pledge also had changes in their behaviors for uh, the similar items. So that's an interesting thing to think about in terms of the experience uh, and the atmosphere and environment that's happening around this um, and how it affects or doesn't affect physically writing down a pledge. So these are examples. Uh, this is not exhaustive for all the ways conservation marketing and engagement can be used, but I really wanted to share examples uh, of like the variety of ways people are using it and testing it, which is really exciting. Um, and again, I really appreciate all of our presenters from last year and the ones that uh, shared their data and slides with me to present here. Uh, and I hope I did not do a disservice to the amazing work that you're doing. Um, the last few slides here, I want to share a little bit more specifically about our working group. Um, and that'll conclude uh, you know, the presentation portion of the webinar. Um, our group, we are only about four or five years old. And our group's mission and goals is to, is to do stuff like this, really. Like, we want to increasingly expose practitioners to the effective use of marketing techniques and tools. We want to share research uh, and to all other SCB groups out there. If you have research that you want to share more broadly, we're happy to share them on our social media channels and in other places. Uh, you know, we really want to be able to get the word out there. Uh, promote opportunities for trainings and nurture uh, multidiscipline, transdiscipline collaborations with a lot of those disciplines I mentioned before, but also want some I didn't mention that I failed to mention, like artists, comedians, filmmakers, all doing amazing work to tell stories, to engage people, and to shape behaviors around conservation. I'm not the only team member, obviously. We have a board of six. Uh, so you already know who I am. Our vice president is Ashley. She will serve as president next year, and I'll transition to past president. Chelsea, our secretary. Lauren, our treasurer. Kevin is our communication officer. And actually, for the first time this year, that's a, a voting position. So we were able to expand our board a bit this year. Uh, Kevin oversees a rock star communications committee with Rosemary, Hannah, and Caitlin. Uh, they'll all be active after this as we get into our Twitter feed of questions. Uh, and Andrew Wright, who's our past president and also co-founder of the group. So he's been involved in the organization for quite a while. Um, we will be having some elections towards the end of this year. We have two board spots that will be opening. Those call for nominations will go out uh, probably in September. So keep your eyes out for that. It's something on my to-do list that I need to work on. Um, so what are we up to? Uh, we have some fun stuff going on. We'd love to get you involved. We're doing social media campaigns, uh, both on Facebook and Twitter. If you follow us, please follow us at uh, SCB Consmark. We did, uh, and we still have this going, if you want to contribute, a share your conservation office uh, photo thread, uh, whether you're someplace cool out in the field or whether you're at a desk like I am, you know, we still love to see your office. Um, we have ongoing right now a summer reading list of books related to conservation, conservation marketing, engagement, outreach, all of the above. Um, we were really excited to join and jump on the 30 Earth Month Heroes campaign that was started. Um, we shared an Earth Month Hero a day. And directly following this webinar, so from 1 to 2 p.m. today, we're doing a, kind of an Ask Us Anything Q&A format on Twitter. Um, so you can use the hashtag AskConsMarkAnything and tag us at SCBConsMark. Um, so if you don't get a chance to have your question answered here or if something pops up afterwards, you can ask us. The big thing we have going on is next year, our next conference. So it'll be our second conference. Uh, we don't have all the details yet, so we hope you will stay tuned and visit our website regularly for more details on location, dates, call for abstracts. Call for abstracts will probably be early next year. Um, but we will be building out some of our conference committees this year, so please reach out if you're interested. Um, consmark at conbio.org. 
and become a member. If your SCB renewal is up this year, you can just check the box and add us to your working groups. Uh, you can do that even if your renewal is not up. Um, and that gives you an opportunity to, to vote, to volunteer, chime in on what we're doing. Um, or you can simply join us online or you can simply, you know, donate to us. Um, opportunities to learn more. Uh, so I actually run uh, my own online course on um, designing and creating behavior change communications for conservation. I call it the Making Moves course. Uh, my next course dates are October to November this year, and registration opens next week. So if you're interested in going even more in depth on how to design a campaign for your efforts, uh, you can check that out. The Social Marketing Association of North America, called SMANA for short, um, they cover social marketing for a variety of topics, so not just conservation, but it does include conservation. They have their first ever conference this year uh, in October in Ottawa. I encourage you to check out them as a group and also this conference. Um, our past president, Andrew, and Ashley Dayer, who is the president of the Social Science Working Group, are putting on a behavior change workshop at the World Marine Mammal Conference this year. Um, that's in December, so you can look out uh, the website there for more information and to register. I think that is a full day workshop. Uh, Lauren Watkins, who is our treasurer, works at an organization called Impact by Design. They're developing a human behavior change masterclass that's going to launch early next year. So, uh, you know, bookmark their website and check it for updates on, uh, you know, how to get involved in that. And then, as I mentioned before, we have our own conference next year. Great opportunity to come network, to learn. We'll have workshops and presentations. So a lot of opportunities to learn more about what we do there. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, you guys have been great. I really appreciate it. I see the ongoing comments and questions. Uh, a little nervous about the number of questions here, but I'm sure we can, you know, knock them out. Um, and again, anything that we don't get to answer here or anything that comes up for you, you know, after we're off air, Join us on Twitter at the after party at uh, Ask Cons Mark Anything. Great. Thank you so much, Brooke. This was amazing. Um, we are so excited to um, have our first working group um, do their webinar. So if you're a member of another working group, you'd like to do a webinar like this, please reach out to us. Um, me specifically, if you'd like, I'm Sarah Weber, again, sweber at conbio.org. Um, now, there are a lot of questions, uh, as, as, as was mentioned. So I'm going to pick and choose a few of them that I um, that I think would be interesting for everyone um, to get an answer to. But as as was mentioned, please reach out to either of us um, or join the Twitter chat um, to ask your question if it's not asked by me right now. Um, so uh, here's the first question. Um, are there scientifically vigorous methods to gauge the effectiveness of a behavior change campaign before and after? Yes, and I actually uh, also see here in the chat box that Edwin is chiming in on this answer as well. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna read his answer before I answer because uh, it looks like a good answer here. Um, so Edwin says there's lots of methods for doing this, qualitative and quantitative. And there is an SCB provisional group called Impact Evaluation Working Group that I think can help out. Um, but yes, so qualitatively and quantitatively, there's a variety of things that we can measure in relationship to conservation marketing and engagement. Everything from, uh, you know, monitoring and evaluation of the conservation goal, you know, that's increase, decrease of species, habitat, health, and all of that. Um, to measuring behavior in different ways. So are we seeing a shift in behavioral intention? Do we even have hard numbers on the number of people recycling, the number of people, um, you know, harvesting in, in more sustainable methods or, or whatever it is for the particular campaign? Um, you know, you can even do for the bushmeat one quantitative surveys on uh, how often people are eating bushmeat posts compared to pre-program. Um, and even, you know, kind of in a more micro area of the marketing and engagement efforts themselves, there are some metrics that I always encourage, and we call them key performance indicators for, you know, marketing speak, to know how engaged your audience is and what you're, what you're putting out there from a communication and engagement uh, aspect. So how much engagement are you getting on social media posts, to your website, 
um, how many people are signing up or pledging or petitioning. Those are all important data points and they they kind of add up to are we having an ultimate impact on the conservation goal. But measuring everything along the way is really important to know what might need to shift and evolve because we're either not getting results or we've plateaued at result and we need to get to the next level. That could be a whole, honestly, that's like a whole webinar in itself right there. Great, thank you. Um, next question, how do you use conservation marketing for long-term issues like climate change? People do not grasp short-term actions with long-term consequences. Hmm. That's a good question. I feel like I have some rants around climate change that I'm going to try to not go into too much depth here. Um, so even uh, I'll back back up for a second that even outside of climate, there is an ongoing behavior change issue with people thinking about today's actions and down the road implications. Uh, and this comes up in all kinds of, uh, you know, other challenges. So people who are trying to get um, individuals to invest in 401k plans or to save for the future have the same issue too. So how do my spending habits today impact my livelihood 20, 30, 40 years down the road? And we just have a psychological disconnect of being able to imagine ourselves that far down the line. Climate change is a similar issue um, of how do we talk about tomorrow's implications of today's actions? And really a way around that is let's talk about today's actions. You know, what are things that we need people to do today and what are the benefits of them doing that today? Uh, and some of those benefits may not be conservation related. And this is something I, I preach a lot in my workshops and my course is there's a lot of benefits for doing actions that may not be we're saving the environment or we're protecting the planet. It may be something more superficial like my neighbor's doing it and so should I. Uh, that are hugely powerful that get us the same results, even if it's not exactly for the same reasons that we think it should be. Um, so that's kind of a roundabout answer to let's focus on what people can do today and why it's in their best interest to do it today, as opposed to trying to teach them to think long term, which is just going to be a, you know sort of a, a psychological cognitive dissonance to begin with. Great. Um, next question is sort of continuing on, you know, not, I mean, climate change shouldn't be controversial, but of course it is in certain areas. Um, so how do you deal with controversial issues like climate change in the U.S. or things like removing feral cats from landscapes? Mm. Yeah, those, uh, so those are actually different uh, for different reasons. Um, Tackling a climate one for a second is uh, there's a theory that I, I also uh, teach a lot about called the diffusion of innovation theory that talks about, you know, a, the rate of adoption. So there's always going to be some laggards um, and we could, if we wanted to, spend all of our time uh, speaking to climate skeptics uh, and trying to convince them otherwise. Or we can capitalize on this much larger actual group of people that are willing to do something, uh, again, for conservation and environmental benefits or for personal benefits to take action today. And I think that's way more worth our time because we can push the, the people who are interested and willing, we can grow that into a tipping point, grow that into a movement that makes it more like this is happening, everybody else get on board. Now, Complicated issues like, you know, people's cats, right? Like these are high emotional issues for a lot of people. Um, if it's possible to engage them earlier on, um, and I, I think that Whale Sense uh, campaign is a great example of that, have them be part of the process. Uh, have them engage. So, you know, I worked with someone in my, my course who was, they have these things called catios, like it's a cat patio, so the cat's like outside but not really outside. Uh, and how to get people uh, motivated to use those and not just have their cat be outside, uh, you know, killing wild birds and becoming, you know, partially feral. Um, and having those individuals, those stakeholders engaged to understand what are their apprehensions, what are their concerns, what are they willing to do, uh, and how do we make it as easy and as socially acceptable for them to do it? Um, 
and I think it really comes down to understanding those groups a bit more and what are those hesitancies and how can we help overcome them. Uh, but it, that particular question sounds like it, it would require a more in-depth conversation, which I'd be happy to have. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question, um, back to the bushmeat case, you know, uh, there was obviously a lot of um, involvement from different groups and media and things like that. So uh, what happens when you want to do something like that, but you're not able to engage the media, you're not in the position to, you don't have the capacity to, um, what are some other ways that people can use um, to change people's perceptions of things like that that aren't, you know, media specific? Sure. I mean, I totally get that big, you know, campaigns like this can be big budget or can be small budget. Um, and we always want the big budget ones, right, where we can do TV and radio and billboards. Uh, and that's not always going to be within our means. Um, I will say I've worked in some really remote places where those things don't cost that much money. So I would evaluate uh, what basically where your campaign is taking place and what those price points are. Um, but if you have a small budget, um, it may involve being a little bit more creative about things and focusing more on the interpersonal aspects of engagement. These can be meetings, workshops, uh, even jumping on existing uh, activities, like there's already a festival happening in town. How can you have a presence there and capitalize on that? Um, PR can sometimes help with that. So yeah, maybe you can't afford a TV commercial. A lot of organizations can't. Is there a way to, to you know, pitch an interview in a newspaper on TV to get some um, exposure? I will also say social media is like basically free and pretty cheap right now, uh, even if you are paying for ads. It's a great place to start if your audience is on those channels. Um, and I, I think an exciting part about marketing right now is that there's, well, what makes it overwhelming is there's an, so many channels growing, but that also presents a lot of opportunity for us to reach our audiences in new, different, and creative ways that won't cost us quite as much money as like TV would. Great. Um, I think this this might be our last question, depending on how how um, <laughs> intricate the answer is. But uh, the uh, so continuing on on budget, um, what happens when you're on a budget and you need to do research of audience and stakeholders? What are some low budget or free ways to to get those answers? Uh, so I'm a big fan, and and I I know that we're probably a very quantitative heavy group. Uh, and I apologize if this is not going to be the most popular question, uh, popular answer. But I'm a big fan of just sitting down and talking to members of the target audience. Uh, it doesn't have to be hundreds of them. Uh, if you're looking for insight on drivers and motivators and uh, current behaviors, sitting down and talking with a dozen of your, I mean, first of all, it's free, right? All, all you're doing is asking for 45, 60 minutes of someone's time. And having that in-depth conversation of what's, what's going on with that individual? What are the trends you see from interview to interview in terms of behaviors, drivers, pressures, uh, the social context in which people are operating in? Um, those are, if you have no money to do any research, go out and talk to your audience. And also, go out and watch your audience. Uh, and not in a creepy don't, don't be creepy stalker about it. Um, but let's say we're looking at, you know, are people using reusable bags or plastic bags when they go grocery shopping? You know, can I spend an hour and just watch what is happening at those checkout lines when people go shopping? What do I see as consistent trends in terms of those decision points, uh, in terms of the conversations happening? That can give you a lot of insight from a really, uh, you know, kind of passive observational perspective. And Typically, it doesn't cost any money to do that. Yep, that sounds that sounds exactly right from my side. <laughs> um, all right, so one last question um, I have uh, before we're out of time. Um, so scaling this up, when you have started a behavior change campaign and you have started to engage the you know the local population on the issue, how do you scale it up to you know change in policies at the state level, the regional level, the national level? Yeah. Um, 
Well, there's a lot of factors there that will make it sort of like an it depends answer, unfortunately, in terms of what the behavior is and the context that you're operating in. Um, but I would consider if you're looking at getting policy change, those policymakers are an audience segment of yours. And what do they what do you know about them? What moves their needle in terms of driving them to make change or even consider change? Um, you know, who are the greatest influencers on those policymakers that they're looking to to either emulate or compete with or any of that? So get into the minds of those individuals as well to see what it is that they would need to make that change. You know, is it they need a petition signed and therefore that helps affect your campaign ask of your other audience? Um, do they need to see that there is sort of a, a, a coalition getting built around this movement that people are actually doing the behavior? Um, and kind of tap into at each level, what are those levers that we can pull that will help motivate change? Um, policy is certainly, without a doubt, a really tricky one. And there's so many factors outside of our control. Um, but thinking of them with that same lens of who are they, what motivates them, and how can we reach them in a way that's going to push them to action can help come up with some strategies for that. Uh, you know, and again, that's local government, national government, you know, and, you know, even global efforts. Great. Thank you so much, Brooke. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have left for questions um, on the webinar itself. But remember, you can go to Twitter and use the hashtag AskConsMarkAnything or email myself or Brooke um, with questions and we'll hopefully get back to you very shortly. The webinar was recorded. I will be sending out a link um, sometime next week to where it's uploaded. It will be uploaded on the Vimeo channel if for some reason you miss, um, miss my email. So thank you all so much for joining and we look forward to seeing you next month for our September webinar. Thank you again, Brooke. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.